a few years ago, just shortly after moving to Seattle, Washington, my family and I were invited to a bar mitzvah. Now we had attended many bar mitzvahs before, but this was the first as part of a conservative synagogue. In this synagogue, the men and the women were seated in separate areas. The women identified folks upstairs in the balcony and the men identified folks downstairs on the main floor with the rabbi. I was told that even though the invitation said to arrive at 8.30, our friends and the parents of the young man let us know that the Saturday morning services lasted for hours and please feel free to show up closer to 10.30 and I am very grateful we got that advice. When we arrived, my daughter and I were, were told to go upstairs as my son and his father were told to go, to go into the main floor. Now, this was a new concept for us and a new experience, especially for my children. And the service was entirely in Hebrew. And because it was an, an, um, a conservative synagogue, there were no, the voices were not amplified. So there were no microphones. So at one point in the service, a bag, a big plastic bag filled with individually wrapped fruit jellies were being passed around. So I took one and next to me, my daughter took one and my neighbor took one. And my neighbor said to me, who also was not Jewish, what is this for? And I said, it must be a snack because the service is so long. So I unwrapped my one piece of candy and so did she and I ate it. And I noticed that everyone else around me were grabbing big handfuls from this bag. And I had all kinds of judgmental thoughts geez, I mean, are you really going to eat all that candy? I thought to myself. Then about 20 minutes later, when the young man of the hour stood and recited from the Torah, when he was done, all of the women stood and flung their handfuls of the wrapped candy down below to the young man. That candy was not for us to eat. I had created an entire story in the 20 minutes of when that bag came around until the candy was thrown. All I needed to do was simply ask someone who was from the synagogue, ask the young man's mom what the protocol was for the candy, but I didn't. Uh, you can bet that the next time we were invited to a bar mitzvah at a conservative synagogue, I knew what to do. I grabbed a huge handful of candy when I was supposed to, and I didn't even eat any. How many parents and caregivers here today with us text your child or text a loved one, and no matter how old they are, if you don't receive a text immediately back, you create all kinds of stories as to your child's whereabouts. And I, when that happens, don't realize how much tension rises with every minute that my text goes unanswered. When I finally get a response, I type back in shouty caps, where were you? Only to find out that my child was napping or taking a test or going about their very reasonable young adult lives. I know that my physical responses to the stress of these narratives cause to teach me or try to teach me to refrain from creating stories that don't serve me or my mental health. We do this all the time. We tell ourselves stories about how we think the world is without asking questions, confirming or clarifying if those assumptions are correct. In our personal lives, this can have humorous results like the story of the candy jellies at the bar mitzvah. In our collective narratives, the stories we tell ourselves often end up having much more problematic and sometimes horrific results. There's a phrase that I learned early in my social work training. It is never too late to have a happy childhood. This is the idea that refers to we can, that we can transform ourselves from challenging beginnings. There's a caveat here that through my anti-racism work and working to unlearn my own internalized oppression, I know that the idea of transforming ourselves is fraught with limitations depending on our identities, our socioeconomic status and our social locations. For Unitarian Universalism, it is not too late to transform our faith to one that more fully lives into the values that we uphold. 
We hold narratives of our Unitarian Universalist faith and of the history of the United States that serve to maintain a falsehood of who we are. And it explains why we are in the current situations that we find ourselves in. For example, many UUs revere and hold the sacred and incomplete narrative of Henry David Thoreau. And I say incomplete because he is widely viewed as this reclusive creative writer who lived by himself in the cabin in the woods. Well, the cabin was on his friend's property. His sister and his mother routinely cleaned his house, did his laundry, and brought him baked goods. We need to remind and tell ourselves the complete version of Thoreau's interdependence. There's nothing wrong with the fact that Thoreau lived on his friend Emerson's land or that he accepted help from his family. In fact, in telling the full version of this mythology, we affirm our need for community and that we cannot and in fact should not go it alone. The idea of self-sufficiency is a fairy tale and that is one way the fallacy of a meritocracy is upheld in the United States. The story of the meritocracy offered in the United States is one that serves only to uphold white supremacy culture and patriarchy and violent extractive capitalism. The notion that if you just work hard enough, you can pull yourself up by the bootstraps. 11 months before his assassination, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was interviewed and asked by a reporter, what is it about the Negro Every other group that came as an immigrant somehow, not easily, but somehow got, ground, got around it. And is it just because they are black? Dr. King responded, quote, white America must see that no other ethnic group has been a slave on American soil. That is one thing that other immigrant, immigrant groups haven't had to face. The other thing is that the color became a stigma. American society made Negroes color a stigma. America freed the slaves in 1863 through the Emancipation Proclamation of Abraham Lincoln, but gave the slaves no land or nothing in reality to get started on. At the same time, America was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest which meant there was a willingness to give the white peasants from Europe an economic base. And yet it refused to give its black peasants from Africa who came here involuntarily in chains and had worked for free for 244 years, any kind of economic base. And so he continues emancipation for the Negro was really freedom to hunger. It was freedom to the winds and rains of heaven. It was freedom without food to eat or land to cultivate. And therefore it was freedom and famine at the same time. And then white America and white Americans tell the Negro to lift himself up by his own bootstraps. They don't look over the legacy of slavery and segregation. Now I believe we ought to do all we can and seek to lift up ourselves up by our own bootstraps, but it is a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself up by his bootstraps. And many Negroes by the thousands and millions have been left bootless as a result of all these years of oppression and as a result of a society that deliberately made his color a stigma and something worthless and degrading. The issue of reparations for descendants of slavery and for Native Americans is one that remains controversial in this country. I came across a March 2019 blog post on a site called Quartz. The article titled, Americans are totally fine with reparations, just not for slavery. The author, Annalisa Morelli. Here are the, she lists a number of instances where reparations were given with little to no controversy. Germany paid over $89 billion in reparations for survivors of the Holocaust. In 1948, the United States Congress issued a reparation fund of $38 million for Japanese Americans interned in camps 
1990, each survivor received approximately $20,000 and about 80,000 people claimed reparations for a total of 1.6 billion. US, uh, United States to the victims of the Tuskegee experiment. In 1932, the US government left 399 black men with syphilis untreated in order to study the development of the disease. The study called the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male, male went on for 40 years. The victims filed a class action suit settling for $10 million worth of reparations for the survivors of the study, their widows and their offspring. In 1995, a guarantee of free lifetime medical care for the victims, their children and spouses was added to the reparation sum. I wanna pause here and interject because in the current rhetoric of the anti-vaccine movement in the current pandemic, the Tuskegee study has been lifted up as a reason not to get vaccines, misunderstanding that it was the group not being given treatment that was the horror in that. The Florida survivors of the Rosewood massacre in January, 1923, the black town of Rosewood in Florida was destroyed in a racist massacre after the lynching of an innocent black man in response to an alleged rape attempt, a white mob attacked and destroyed Rosewood, burning homes and churches. At the time, the official death toll was eight, yet at least 26 victims have now been confirmed and the toll might even be higher. In 1994, the state of Florida issues, issued $2.1 million in compensation to be split amongst the massacre survivors. In 2015, the city of Chicago acknowledged that more than 100 black prisoners had been subject to torture by the police, which pushed some to confess to crimes they hadn't committed. The city awarded the 57 of those survivors a payment in cash together with free college and social services. The sum total of $5.5 million was officially labeled as reparations and Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel at the time issued an official apology and mandated that torture be studied in public school curricula. So in all of these case, cases, reparations were given out not just as financial compensation, but as a tangible recognition that a wrong had been done and that the United States or its states and cities held a debt toward a specific group. Opposition to reparations for slavery suggests that many Americans are not ready to accept that there is a debt to be paid to the descendants of those who endured the horrors of slavery and segregation under Jim Crow laws. Ever heard anyone say, well, I didn't own slaves. This one maintains the status quo of inaction and not creating a different system that interrupts the continued harm perpetrated by the state on black and brown people. Another story that we tell ourselves that serves to maintain the status quo is we are a nation of immigrants. What we are is a nation of settler colonizers, Native Americans who had their land stolen, descendants of slaves who had free labor extracted from them for generations and hundreds of years. If we told the complete and true story of the beginning of European dominance and colonization, it would not be up for debate that this country was built on the blood and tears of black and brown bodies. Reparations would be the least we could do. I am an immigrant born in Egypt, a country who's had its ancient treasures pilfered and stolen. My mother still curse, curses the effects of British colonization on our country. Even as an immigrant to this, to this land, to the United States, I work to educate and advocate for reparations for the descendant of enslaved Africans, along with reparations for the genocide of indigenous people of this continent. In order to have this country make right wrongs committed that continue to be committed against black and brown people. Not interrupting these narratives serves to continue the fairy tale of who is deserving in this country. We have only to read about and watch videos of what is happening in our names on the southern border and all across the world. This is a continuation of the continued distorted narrative of who belongs and who doesn't. 
This week, the Supreme Court struck down a mandate by the president to, for every corporation and every place to mandate vaccines and only healthcare workers, the mandate to have healthcare workers be vaccinated was upheld. Someone on social media made the point that it is healthcare workers who will serve those in government and who cares about those in corporations, whether or not they survive this pandemic. Another example of violent extractive capitalism and who is worthy and who is worth less. We have an opportunity to always tell ourselves a different story, to understand and learn what is true by asking those most impacted. I'm going to end with a for another excerpt from a letter of, from a Birmingham jail written by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Quote, oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The urge for freedom will eventually come. This is what happen, has happened to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom. Something without has reminded him that he can gain it. Consciously and unconsciously, he has been swept in by what the Germans call the Zeitgeist and with his black brothers of Africa and, and I will add siblings and his brown and yellow siblings of Asia, South America and the Caribbean. He is moving with a sense of cosmic urgency toward the promised land of racial justice. Recognizing this vital urge that has engulfed in the Negro community, one should readily understand public demonstrations. The Negro has many pent up resentments and latent frustrations. They have to get them out. So let them march sometimes, let them have their pilgrimage to the city hall, understand why there must be sit-ins and freedom rides. If these repressed emotions do not come out in these non-violent ways, they will come out in ominous expressions of violence. This is not a threat, it is a fact of history. So I have not said to my people, he continues, get rid of your discontent, but I have tried to say that this normal and healthy discontent can be channeled through the creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. This approach has been dismissed as extremist. I must admit, I was initially disappointed in being so categorized. As we commemorate the holiday tomorrow that commemorates the birth of Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. <sighs> Let us remember that we continue not to tell the true story of this country and that as Unitarian Universalists, we are charged with telling the true story, with move, being on the side of love and justice and equity. <sighs> Blessed be. Amen and Ashe.